Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Daniel Mulugeta. I'm a lecturer of African politics and uh, chair for Center uh, for African Stu uh, Pan African Studies. Um, um, this is our first seminar. Uh, the, the Center for Pan African Studies is a, a platform for interdisciplinary research uh, on issues related to uh, African continental politics and diaspora politics. Uh, this is also a hub for policy dialogue and public engagement. Uh, today's event is uh, just a demonstration of that. Uh, we are delighted to have Gary Yang and uh, uh, Onikachi Wambu uh, for a conversation about Gary Yang's book, uh, Dispatch from Diaspora, from Nelson Mandela to Black Lives Matter. So this conversation is being moderated by uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Mikhail Roldu. Uh, I hand over to her. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Michal Voldu. I am one of the postdoctoral research fellow within the Center of Pan-African Studies. And uh, welcome to our first event today. Uh, we look forward to an insightful conversation. Um, so just before we get started, uh, in the unlikely event, there is a fire alarm. Our fire exit will be one over there and one over here. So try to make sure that you find your way out in the orderly manner. And yeah, so with no further ado, let me introduce you uh, our speaker uh, today. So Gary Young uh, is an award-winning author, broadcaster, and a professor of sociology at the University of Manchester in England. Formerly a columnist at The Guardian, he's an editorial board member of The Nation magazine, the Alfred Nobel Fellow for Type Media, and winner of the 2023 Orwell Prize uh, for Journalism. He has written six books, including the one that we're going to discuss today, Dispatches from the Diaspora from Nelson Mandela to Black Lives Matter, uh, The Speech, The Story Behind Martin Luther King's Dream, Who Are We and Should It Matter in the 21st Century? He has also written for the New York uh, Review of Books, Granta, GQ, The Financial Times, and The New Statesman, and made several radio and television documentary on subjects ranging from gay marriage to Brexit. So welcome, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> um, and our discussion today will be uh, Onyeka Chiriwambu, who is Nigerian-British journalist and writer. He has directed television documentaries for the BBC, Channel 4, and PBS. Uh, he has written widely on the African diaspora. His most recent publication is the anthology Empire Windrush, reflection on 75 years uh, and more of the Black British experience. He's currently the director of special project at the African Foundation for Development, also known as AFWR, an international organization uh, that aims to expand and enhance the contribution the African diaspora make to African development. So with no further ado, I will give uh, pass the mic to Gary and Onyekachi to uh, lead the discussion. Uh, and later we will have some time for a Q&A as well. So thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the kind introduction, Mikhail, and for um, inviting me. I'm just going to talk for about 15 minutes to tell you what it is that we're going to talk about. And um, it is really a collection of my journalism and essays, mostly but not exclusively in The Guardian, from the Black diaspora. So uh, uh, Britain, America, Africa, Caribbean, uh, elsewhere in Europe, wherever there are Black people, basically. But I Spent 12 years as a US correspondent for The Guardian in America and um, most of the rest of the time here, but did quite a lot of work in Africa and the Caribbean. I want to start with the category because it was the category that I was warned off of when I started journalism. I was basically told by uh, senior colleagues who were also white colleagues, they were mostly the only senior colleagues who were around, either that I should never write about race because I would be quote unquote pigeonholed. You will be seen as a black journalist, to which I would answer, I am a black journalist. Um, or I would be told you can only write about race. Uh, the first column that I did for The Guardian was about Bosnia and it was spiked because um, 
the editor said, we don't really, the editor of that section said, we don't really need you for that. There are other people who can do that. And so the struggle was always to be able to write about race and other things. And of course, race is generally not just about race. It is generally also about other things. Uh, and um, uh, yes, and that where, where, where necessary or where I was interested to, to do the things that I thought had a, um, I had some either passion for or expertise for. And it starts with uh, Nelson Mandela because that was the piece that got me my job. When I was 24, 25, I'm sent to South Africa uh, because as a liberal institution, The Guardian is wise enough to understand that there are many stories that its all white team cannot get, um, but not sufficiently uh, progressive or advanced who have actually employed the black journalists that they would want to send there so that they can cover it. And so they look around for somebody young, black and cheap in the office. And I was very young and black and very cheap. So I was sent to South Africa to find out what I could find out. I could not drive. As a result of me not being able to drive, I would get lifts from different people. And to cut a very long story short, I am left at a gas station other people are going to come and they're going to pick you up. Those people are Mandela's bodyguards. I amuse them uh, during the trip back. I've studied in the Soviet Union, as had they. My first degree was in French and Russian. Uh, I was involved in the anti-apartheid movement. I had flirted with the communist movement. Many of those were in the Communist Party. And so we get on. They're like having me around. They call me sometimes, say, we're going here. Do you want to come with us? And I stumble at this young age, not really knowing what I'm doing, very inexperienced, into Mandela's entourage, basically. Uh, you have to imagine it's 2008 and you stumble into Obama's cavalcade. This, and, um, uh, and the piece I wrote at the end of that period gets me my job. Now the book uh, comes in, uh, there are five chapters, uh, each one, with one exception, four of them are uh, uh, lean on uh, some kind of black cultural artistic trope. So the first is change is going to come. Those are the more positive stories, the stories that, you know, generally speaking, would give you warm fuzzies. So the, the, uh, the Mandela election, the Obama election, um, uh, not the shooting of... Um, um, Michael Brown, certainly, but the uprisings in Ferguson, uh, even Mandela's funeral is a kind of a, is a festival of kinds. Uh, and it also looks at, uh, it treats, and this is true throughout the book, there is a lot of reportage. So that's one of the ways in, if you like, is I was there. I was there um, uh, for the Mandela election. I was on the south side of Chicago for the Obama election. I was in New Orleans just days after Katrina happened. I was there on the night that Zimmerman uh, was acquitted of the murder of Trayvon Martin and so on. Uh, um, quite often, they're not necessarily the best pieces of writing that I've done, but they are in a crucial moment. Um, the next chapter is called Things Fall Apart. And I go back to South Africa five years after Mandela's elected. It's, these are the less hopeful, more um, critical moments where it's important to kind of st stand back from the euphoria that existed at a certain point uh, and look at what we've got. I go to Zimbabwe um, uh, as it's falling apart to look at what happened to Mugabe and how he went from the hope of the continent to the disaster that Zimbabwe was at a certain point. Um, I do gun deaths in America. I look at a boy, the boy who killed and a mum who tried to stop him, which is set here, where I interview the mother of a boy who stabbed another boy to death um, uh, and look at uh, issues of knife crime. Eight years after um, Obama's tenure, uh, I write a piece called Yes, He Tried, as opposed to Yes, He Can, and look at the equivocal, uh, uh, as I see it, kind of uh, verdict, uh, uh, somewhat ambivalent verdict on his presidency. Um, the third chapter is called Ways of Seeing. That's the 
draws on John Burgess, so not not the Black Cultural Trope, which is mostly essays, really, and thought experiments um, where I kind of um, use my lens, which I guess I'm always using my lens, but this is kind of more, more specific, one might say, to, um, uh, to examine certain phenomena. So I ask, what would a white history month look like? You know, if um, uh, every time Black History Month comes around, there's always someone, oh, what if we did that? It's like, okay, well, what if we did do that? What would that be? Um, in the wake of George Floyd, I asked, what does Black America actually mean to Europe? The place that Black America holds in the European imaginary. Um, I write about Uncle Tom uh, in defense of him, not the racial slur, but the uh, literary character. So most people haven't read the book. They just use the slur. And actually, Uncle Tom, while he's not a revolutionary, he's definitely, um, uh, he is in many ways quite heroic. He won't run when the other slaves run, but he'd rather die, and he does die, than tell the master where the slaves have run to. He would rather pick another slave's cotton and risk getting beaten for it than watch them suffer. He refuses to beat other slaves. Um, but also, um, in that piece, I look at, like, I have an issue with the term Uncle Tom, the essentializing nature of it, the de-blacking of it, the way in which um, the, the issue that I have with a certain, uh, I think, actually unfounded expectations that... Um, well, they're black and so they should do this or they should do that. And every identity has it, I think. People who police its borders, West Brits who are Irish, but not quite Irish enough. Um, one person described, one Jewish person described to me anti-Zionist Jews as being people of Jewish extract because they've had all the Jewishness extracted from them. These are, this is all the same kind of politics to me and a very dangerous kind of politics. Um, I uh, raise issues about Bridgerton. I also make an argument, once again, a thought experiment for why one could argue that we should just take all statues now. Um, not just the ones of the people that we don't like, but the ones of people that we do, that they are very poor ways to remember people. Um, Chapter four, Express Yourself, is a series of interviews uh, with a range of people, uh, Andrew Levy, Stormzy, um, John Carlos, one of the guys who raised his fist in the 68 Olympics, um, Lewis Hamilton, uh, Bishop Tutu, uh, my Angela Davis, my favorite, um, not necessarily my favorite piece, but my favorite uh, experience being interviewing Maya Angelou, where we had, we were supposed to have 45 minutes. And 13 hours later, I roll out of her limo drunk, uh, uh, her being only slightly less drunk. Um, and then finally, Me, Myself, I, which are a series of personal essays about traveling through Europe about leaving America, um, about my first experience of being in America for any period of time. And I'm gonna end uh, the introduction with the last piece that I wrote for The Guardian, um, uh, the last column that I wrote for The Guardian, I should say, which was shortly after, as in just over a month after the last election, which did not, quite go the way I wanted it to. When I was a child, my mum used to put on the song Young, Gifted and Black by Bob and Marcia, put my feet on hers and then dance us both around the living room. They're playing our song, she'd say. It was the early 70s. She was barely 30 and I was the youngest of three children she was raising alone. 
struggling to believe there was a viable future for her children in a country where racism was on the rise and the economy was in the tank, she danced with us around the living room, singing ourselves up, imagining a world in which we would thrive for which we had no evidence that we did have great expectations. Much of the politics that's informed my writing in these columns came from my mum. It's partly rooted in her experience. She came to Britain just a month after the Commonwealth Immigrant, Immigrants Act of 1962. She came because the then health minister, Enoch Powell, had embarked on a colossal program of NHS restructuring that required more nurses. As such, she was living proof of the immigrants that the British economy needs, but that its political culture is too toxic to embrace. For her, sex, race, and class were not abstract identities, but forces that converged to keep her wages low and her life stressful. But my politics is also rooted in what she made of those experiences. She was an anti-colonialist and an anti-racist, an internationalist and a humanist, who would never have used any of those words to describe herself. Race conscious as she was, most of her community activism, youth clubs, literacy classes, discos in the church hall, took place in the working class white community. They were her people too. When I was 10, she made me stay up and watch the Holocaust miniseries, which freaked me out. And when I was 14, she took me to watch Gandhi during the holidays, which was way too long. Both times she told me, this is your story too. She believed the world she wanted to create was never gonna to come to her, so she would have to take the fight to it. I saw her confront the local National Front candidate, the police and her union to name but a few. She took me on my first rally, helped the aged when I was four, my first demonstration, CND, when I was 14, and my first picket, the South African Embassy at 17. I sign off from this column at a dispiriting time, with racism, cynicism, and intolerance on the rise, wages stagnant, and faith that progressive change is possible, declining, <clears throat> even as resistance grows. Things look bleak. The propensity to despair is strong, but should not be indulged. Sing yourself up. Imagine a world in which you might thrive, for which there may be no evidence, and then, fight for it. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. And um, I think that final quote is so powerful because um, a little bit of what I guess we've been doing over the last 500 years is singing that song and there's no evidence for it, but triumphing nevertheless. Um, I've just returned from a reparations conference in Ghana, um, which I think before we came in, I was saying to you, it, it reminded me a little bit of the 1958 or Africa conference that Nkrumah called to begin the process of decolonization. Everybody was there. Um, the Ghanaian president, I guess, is looking for some kind of legacy, but he called everybody together. The African Union were involved. And CARICOM, interestingly, were involved and they're going to establish a committee. But we'll come to that later. But these issues of diaspora are very much on my mind, as you can imagine, at the moment. And in many ways, your book deals with that unresolved business of what I now choose to call the African Atlantic, slavery, empire, and colonization. Um, but before we, we delve into some of those issues, I, I, I just wanted to look at the process of putting together the book. Um, you know, your output over that period of time is in, must be immense. You were doing a weekly column. So how did you get to choose the pieces that you did eventually choose for the book and, and organize them into those under those headings that, that you chose? Yeah, so... Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so, first of all, there were the moments. So, there had to be something from Katrina. There had to be something from Obama. There had to be 
uh, uh, something from the Mandela election, you know. So there were there were inflection points, if you like. Um, then, um, and there are more than you would think in terms of you know some of the ones that I didn't mention, like McPherson. Um, uh, or the Windrush scandal, or so on. So there, so there were those. Um, so then you would look through the pieces of the time, and you would kind of be getting what you thought were the best ones, but also the ones that were most evocative. Because sometimes a piece might be really evocative of a moment, but that moment is not particularly memorable, you know, um, and. Then there are then there would be others um, that were kind of too long. Mm. Um, I I was quite determined to try and keep the book to a hundred thousand words more or less, which is kind of average size of a book, and not overindulge myself. Um, were, were those the nation pieces, the very long pieces? Uh, some of them, but also the New York Review of Books piece. Um, there were a couple of pieces. There was there was one piece that I spent a long time on and I was really proud of, uh, which was a year after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in New Orleans and it was about the jazz players of New Orleans. But it was about four and a half thousand words. And I, then I'd have had to take something else out. There were pieces that, in terms of ones that hit the cutting room floor, there were pieces that I remembered as being about race and that they were about about the black diaspora, but mainly they were they they centered on the Muslim experience, and um, it's not that that is uh, irrelevant to the black experience. It was just that there were some of them where the issue was really hinged around kind of religiosity, mm. and the, there were particularly in the wake of nine eleven and seven seven, there were things that they were saying about. Islam and Muslims that they were not saying about black people. And so, um, you know, there were a few pieces which I thought, well, that's got to go in. And then when I reread it, I thought, oh yeah, no, that was about, it was about, usually it was about white people um, in contradistinction to the way that they were describing Muslims, not, you know, so I did one piece called, they called Let's Have an Open and Honest Conversation About White People, because they kept saying, this is New Labour, we need to have an open and honest conversation about Muslims. And that meant that the conversation was neither going to be open nor honest and that they were just going <laughs> to repeat the same old racist tropes. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, we can't be afraid to say it. And then they'll say the thing that, like, every racist was saying. Very and uh, so then I was like, OK, well, let's just talk about why people like that. You know, mm -hmm. why do you keep murdering everybody? <laughs> what You know, how do you equate Christianity with... Um, um, with um, how, how do you balance the fact that you're Christians with all of the genocide that's been done in the name of Christianity? Mm. You know, how do you this, how do you that? Like, uh, and then I did another one, which was very similar, <laughs> which was questions white people don't get asked. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is flesh colored, that kind of thing. And, um, uh, but when I reread them, they were more about Islam. So I, I took them out. Yeah. Um, there was one that I kind of, um, uh, there was a, an issue of uh, geographical dispersion. So, um, and I think it falls down in that front. I think there aren't enough pieces from the Caribbean and there could have been more. I did an interview with Mia Motley for Vogue, but they're asking quite a lot of money to reprint it. And um, I didn't want to give them it. Um, there was... Um, uh, there were some pieces about a piece about returnees. There was a piece about gay life in Jamaica. All of these kind of might have gone in, but just uh, and there was a piece from Haiti. Mm. Um, so a lot of that's you know why the pieces didn't the pieces didn't go in. But those are the choices that uh, I was. Mm. It was under under that criteria. And then once I chose the pieces, then I um, decided. The interview section was easily decided. The personal essay section was easily decided. The issue of whether things are going up or going down is quite difficult, right? Ferguson, a boy is killed. 
or young man, and then there are uprisings. Is that positive? I think the uprising is positive, but the thing that came out of it is certainly yeah. isn't. Yeah. Um, the Notting Hill Carnival, it comes out of the pogroms of the 1958 pogroms, but then it's a celebrate, you know. So um, w with those categories, one could argue the toss about quite a few of them. Did you, um, I guess, look at sort of if you obviously looked at issues of topicality and what was also uh, relevant? Um, were there many that, you know, they say when you do those columns, it's the kind of first draft of history and people get things wrong in terms of where they, where they think things are going? Were there many instances where you wrote something and you were reading back over your material you thought oh my god I got that completely wrong or... you know not really but here's why um I I tend to not really make a lot of predictions and if you don't make a lot of predictions you can't get them wrong <laughs> and um the, the and there's a reason for that which is that journalists particularly economists and there's a higher proportion of columnists that come from private school in Oxbridge than people who went to private school in Oxbridge and then become lords. Mm -hmm. So that's how posh mm -hmm. they are. In that category, they think they can see the future. Uh, actually, they think that they make the future. Mm -hmm. And so they're, and I don't think it's a journalist's job to predict the future particularly when the present is so engaging and interesting, we can just describe the present. And we can, from the present, we can say, well, it, it looks like these are the things that we should look at. But um, yeah, I remember coming back from the States and I came back about a month before Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party in 2015. And I met this woman who said, like, well, Labour have already, no, Corbyn's already lost the election. And I said, I thought he, he just won the election to be leader. And she said, um, oh, I'm in 2020. It was 2015. I said, why are you talking about 2020 in the past tense? Like, it hasn't. And he said, yeah, but everybody knows he's going to lose. And I said, well, did you know he was going to win? And she said, no, no, nobody did. And I said, did you know that Cameron was going to win in 2015? And she was like, no. And I said, well, son, maybe you're not very good at predicting the future. You know, maybe maybe, maybe that's not working for you. Uh, so I, um, uh, so you won't find in there many like, you know, this way, this is where it's going. So the Mandela one, I talk about like, could this be a disappointment? Could be. You know, that's a possibility. Um, um, with the Obama's election, I say that there's lots of questions that we can ask on the night of the election. There's lots of questions that can be asked about his political trajectory and so on and so on. Let's ask him tomorrow. And tonight people are partying. Tonight is a celebration and tomorrow they can do that. But that... Um, um, but yeah, that one one good one surefire way not to get things wrong is to not to claim that you gonna, you're getting them right. Um, but then, if if you're looking at sort of trajectories and and how things repeat themselves, I mean, I mean, I remember the night Obama was elected. It wasn't to say that he was going to be a disappointment, but we were have you know having conversation with with friends, and everybody said, well. If you look at what happened after emancipation, um, it only took 10 years and then there was a massive, um, you know, response and the Ku Klux Klan and, and then you spend another 100 years or so, well, 50 years or, sorry, 75 years or so under Jim Crow. So we all sat down and we predicted that there would be a, we didn't know how it would come. We didn't know it would be the Tea Party, but it was almost clear that something was going to come back that was going to be vicious. But but everybody just celebrated 
obviously, you know, the party was great. Um, it was a huge symbolic moment, but there were kind of undercurrents that something vicious was going to come. Well, yeah, I, first of all, I don't think there's anything wrong in saying, well, um, there are precedents to this, mm. but actually kind of the, the the challenge that I would have there is that, because because my reading of Obama, and this became, didn't become contentious, but it was irritating to a lot of people, was this is of great symbolic importance, but substantially, actually, it's not emancipation. It's not that at all, that he was not offering anything very much different mm. apart from looking different. Mm. Um, I still would have supported him against Hillary if I'd had a vote because he was against the war and Hillary wasn't, and that was a major test. And mm. um, uh, and he was cohering a group of, uh, a progressive group that Hillary Clinton was and, and so on. But that actually he never promised to do much. And so... It was like a phantom pregnancy or something. Mm. It wasn't emancipation, mm. you know, and and um, uh, and so in the realm of not predicting but describing, an example would be, um, uh, you know, that I was saying, well, if what he has, they were describing it as a movement, this Obama movement. And I wrote, well, it's not a movement, it's an election campaign. And once he's elected, mm. then there, it has, there is no reason for it to exist. But if he is gonna succeed in doing anything, there will have to be a movement because someone is gonna have to make him do things. Yeah. And, um, um, and that was me not saying there will be a movement or there won't be a movement, but, um, but like, let's not misdescribe this. But in the end, what we got was a backlash mm. without the lash. There was no lash. Mm. I mean, he came in, um, folded on the banks, mm. um, um, assisted in the bailout, mm. um, negotiated with himself before he negotiated with anybody else, and um, and then met his enemies halfway when they hadn't moved anywhere. Mm. So and destroyed uh, Libya. <laughs> well, and that too. Well, that was what one of my mm. friends said. The one thing we know is that if he becomes president, he will kill black people. Mm. Like that, that is part of the job description. So, how much room then do you have? I mean, perhaps in the nation you were able to go further, but so within the Guardian and others to talk about that room for or for an alternative take on Obama or the room for. To, you know, talking about the, the movement and, and what would be involved in constructing that. How much room is there to talk about that? And, and I wanted to talk about that, particularly in relation to, say, Mandela and Mugabe, who you do um, some really interesting and great portraits of, but not necessarily what they were dealing with. I mean, it, again, it was clear from the deal that had been done that just to get everybody who was out of work back into work, the economy would have had to have grown mm. by about 5%. And it was never going to do that. So to a certain extent, there is an assessment that you have to make that I think <laughs> we all, in whatever intellectual endeavours we are making, we all make, which is where... Where are we at? <laughs> where is this conversation at? What, where, if you're going to devise um, some kind of intervention, then you have to assess the point of intervention. Um, and that's different from indulging it, mm. but actually assessing where are people at and what do I want to do with this conversation? What do I, what, and what can I do? in 1,200 words or 3,000 words. What is possible? Um, and that, um, you know, if you get it, if, if, you, if you get it wrong, it can be quite embarrassing if you kind of make an assessment and actually that's not where people are at all. Mm -hmm. But say with, with Mugabe, writing for The Guardian, I was dealing with 
a readership, many of whom hadn't really thought much about Mugabe for about 20 years, and that he had returned as this wanton, um, opportunistic uh, wrecker of his economy. And so the aim was to say, look, there's actually a story to this. This is not who he has always been, and arguably it's not entirely who he is. And this has come... This comes through a certain lens, and um, you know, I just want to broaden the lens out. Um, with Obama, the second piece I write about Obama, yes, he tried. You were coming to the end of Obama's tenure with the likelihood or the possibility of a Trump presidency. And so just saying Obama didn't do this and didn't do that, people are like, yeah, Jesus, do you know what I mean? He didn't do any of that either. And so the whole time you were trying to um, say, look, I think the Obama, the Obama um, piece, I start with the boy, the young boy, going into his office uh, to, uh, with his dad, and the two kids are allowed to ask a question and, and his brother asks about some military jet, murderous piece of weaponry. And this other little black boy says, is your hair like mine? And Obama says, touch it. And the boy's kind of reticent. And Obama <laughs> bends over, and there's this great picture in the White House of Obama bending over and the boy touching his hair. And so it speaks to like the symbolic importance of this moment. It's a, it's a vignette. And then I can go from the symbol and then I can start peeling it away and mm -hmm. say, actually, his life chances aren't better now. Mm -hmm. he, he may feel better about himself, but his life chances aren't better. <laughs> and this isn't better and this isn't better. But you know what? It's better than that. And it's better than this and I, so on. So I, I like that constantly throughout the book, um, you remind people about that. Uh, and the statistics and you know and you avoid some of those conversations that we're quite guilty of I mean I remember about around Libya having a conversation with an African-American woman and pointing out some of the disasters that were there um, as a result of that action and she said to me don't take that away from me because mm. you made me feel good and I'm like well you're feeling good yeah, has destroyed Mali and <laughs> and you know given Boko Haram all these arms and you know uh, and sodomized an African president. Mm. Um, but it's it's very hard to calibrate how you deal with these symbolic first that are important, but also real politics about whether our life chances are actually changed as a result of the symbolism. Well, I think that there is something to be said for honoring the symbolism, saying, yes, this is symbolically important, but let's not mistake it for substance. Mm -hmm. Symbols are not insubstantial, but they're not substance. Mm -hmm. And that I hope, because I did, you know, just irritate, mm -hmm. like I said, I irritated people over Obama because I wouldn't get excited. And particularly in America, like that's a national sport, mm -hmm. getting excited. So, um, that people would say, like, this will be, my son was born the weekend that Obama declared. And people would say, this will be great for your son. And I'd say, why? And it was just like, well, you know, don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, no. Yeah, yeah, I'd say, well, you know, um, is he going to improve his chances of going to university? Is he going to improve his chances of getting a job? Is he going to decrease his chance of getting shot, dead, or going to jail? Because if he's not going to do any of those things, why? You know, and I go, be black president, it'll be great, it'll be great. And I said, okay, so then it would be great if Condoleezza Rice became president. And they'd be like, no. And I'd be like, well, why not? She's black. And I'd be like, well, that's different. And I'm like, okay, so then let's talk about that. Why? So it's oh. not just that he's black. Oh, or, Cruella, that, or Cruella becomes. Yeah, like well, exactly. That like if you if you're not careful, then you open <laughs> the door mm. to you know, imagining somebody chained to a you know, uh, airplane seat heading for Rwanda saying, thank God an Asian woman did this, mm -hmm. you know, because that's real progress. And so we have to kind of think critically about what we want from these moments of representation. Absolutely. And better to start with, better to start with him mm -hmm. 
than to start with these. And it's, then the, the, at least you have some yeah. uh, uh, consistency. And that does start with saying, I understand that there may be symbolic importance to having Rishi Shunak or Pretty Patel or symbolic importance to them being. And so I'm not going to say, we're not going to spend so much time arguing for greater non-white representation. And then when it comes in the form that we don't like, say, well, it doesn't count, but we have to think about how it counts. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a great quote in there from Angela Davis, one of you here, when she talks about diversity, 21st century diversity, in particular as being the difference that brings no difference and the change that makes no change. Mm -hmm. um, and that we, you know, that we need a different system, not just different colored hands pulling the levers of the same system. Every time I visited um, South Africa over the last 20 years, the constant refrain, the country where everything changed and nothing changed. Mm. Um, so I think ordinary people get that um, very profoundly. I, I was struck just on that point with Angela Davis that, you know, the, the interviews that you did, you know, were around, I guess, were they personal heroes? Well, they seem to be me uh, to be about people who were both symbolically important, whether um, Lewis Hamilton or others, but who had a bit of substance. Was was that kind of deliberate, or were you um, going for other uh, things when you when you went to meet your heroes in a way, if, if there were heroes? Um, a lot of them were, not all of them. I, you know, I wouldn't. I like. Lewis Hamilton, I wouldn't call him a hero exactly. Um, I was very impressed by Stormzy. That's more of a man crush, really, than <laughs> hero <laughs> heroism. And I didn't know when I was going to see him that I would crush on him. Um, uh, and that's the nature of the that's the nature of the organ that I was writing for. To be honest, that. Quite often they set up the interviews anyway. The Guardian okay. would say, oh, Bishop Tutu's in town. Will you go interview him? Um, and the Guardian isn't just going to interview someone because, well, they might actually, but like they're not going to send me to just interview someone because they're pretty or because they're fast or because they're like, that's to be, that's to be something else about them. Um, and actually, um, Yeah, so so usually there was this some there was this this element, and it might be something actually entirely commercial. It might just be a book coming out or something like that. But then you're trying to you, you're trying to expand the um, uh, the gaze. I mean, the the interview that I'm most proud of, and actually the piece in the whole collection that I'm most proud of is of Claude Colvin. Mm. who, um, for those who don't know, Claudia Colvin was, she um, she was a 15-year-old uh, girl in Montgomery who was kicked off the bus and who pleaded not guilty. And they were going with her. She was going to be the one that they were. And then she was very dark-skinned, wrong side of town. She got pregnant. And so they just dropped her. Mm. And in any civil rights book, they mentioned Claudia Colvin. And that's all they do. They mention her. More less, it's different now than it was, and I, I, I sincerely hope that my piece had something to do with why it's different now. Um, because I hadn't read an interview with her before, and it took me two years to find her, just going from relative to relative. And she'd moved; she was a nurse's aide in the Bronx. And it's, it's a first of all, it's a story about her, and it's an amazing story. It's also a story that complicates our understanding of the civil rights movement, which of course I'm glad for, but it wasn't without its problems. It was male-led, church-led, quite conservative culturally, the kind of movement that would drop a 15-year-old who became pregnant and say, we can't desegregate, but as if her pregnancy has anything to do with desegregating buses. Now, obviously, and Claudette says this, like, yeah, politically, it was probably going to be really hard in the 50s to run with me, but they didn't just not back me on that. They just 
just dropped me out of everything. Mm -hmm. But also in that story, you see how they mistreated Rosa Parks mm -hmm. and that Rosa Parks and how history has mistreated Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. and that Rosa Parks, you get a sense from the way that these stories are told, if they're told at all, which they weren't really when I was at school, that, you know, Rosa Parks was this kind of quiet old lady, first of all, she wasn't that old, who, um, you know, she was tired one day and she left work and like, and her feet were hurting. And so it's like if she'd had a better pair of shoes, there wouldn't have been a civil rights movement. <laughs> when in fact, Rosa Parks had been like kicked off loads of buses. She was a menace. She was an activist. She was a feminist. She didn't believe in nonviolence. And so they, the local Mal civil rights. Malcolm X support. Yeah. The local mm -hmm. civil rights establishment kind of got sick of her because she wouldn't just turn up and look like an old lady with a bun in her hair. She had things to say, which is why she moved to Detroit. She's like, I've had enough of you, you like feckless, mediocre men. So um, it, it was a really Claudette story opened up a route to understanding how we misunderstand, willfully and wantonly misunderstand history. Thanks for that. Um, the the final area, and I know all of you are really waiting to, to ask uh, Gary additional questions. The final area I wanted to kind of discuss with you was just about this diaspora that you're sending the dispatches for from, and how you conceptualize it, and and also um, kind of issues of your identity. I mean, I was struck by all your travels in the book. You go to to across Europe, you go to America, and you return from America. And each time at the end, you kind of say, "Well, um, it's, it's important that I return." You seem uncomfortable, and then you say, "Let me return to a racism I understand in the, in the mm. UK," which is, which is, which is, um, because all those other racisms are, you know, a little bit different. And so I, I wondered what, how you can conceptualize that diasporic space and and where you think you know comfort lies I mean is it in the end in kind of racist or blighty because we've made the struggles here mm. and we know what it is what we're, we're kind of dealing with and everywhere else it's a little bit a, a different kind of racism so just some thoughts on on that so I guess the diaspora is one that I'm willing into being, right? Because the truth is, certainly in America, none of them have heard of us in Britain. Do you know what I mean? They're not talking about us. You know, we might be talking about Michael Brown or or George Floyd, but they're not talking about Stephen Lawrence. Um, um, and in America, they don't talk much about Africa either, apart from as a kind of yeah. an element of the past, as a kind of, uh, 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 you know, a kind of uh, almost a mythical Wakanda. root. Yeah, Wakanda, yeah. Um, and, um, and then it's not like in the Caribbean until relatively recently, they're really talking about Africa yeah. or, I mean, they talk about America quite a lot and African-Americans. They weren't talking about us much either there, uh, to be honest. Um, uh, Britain, uh, black people in Britain, because of the position of Britain and because of our ties to elsewhere, had a more cosmopolitan diasporic feel. But generally speaking, it was us thinking about them. It wasn't them thinking about us. So um, this is me kind of almost instinctively and the kind of the articles I write about black people are a third of um I thought that was wine. I was like, yeah, I was like, I didn't know it was that kind of pie. Uh, Did you see the open mouth? Yeah, I, I know, I know. Um, um and so thank you. Um Thanks. So it's a diaspora that's willed into being, and it's willed into being through in my life. Like I, um, 
you know, I grow up not defining myself as British until I'm kind of 17, 18, because it didn't feel like it was a way to be British. I realize I'm British when I go to Sudan to work in a refugee school. I come back and study French and Russian. Uh, but when I go to Paris, I study the black French novel. Mm. I'm kind of, um, uh, you know, South Africa, anti-apartheid movement. I'm, I'm constantly looking for black people. And, and I mean in that politically black people. I'm looking for the Roma and um, for the, you know, uh, the, the people who are catching hell, um, who uh, frankly may not always be black. I do not a lot, but a fair amount of columns from the North and the South of Ireland. So, um, so it's kind of, I mean, it is a black dust, but it's also kind of the world that I've built for myself that, by chance, I get to visit. Um, there was a funny thing happened when I left America in 2015, which is that people would say, "Are you, uh, uh, are you leaving because of the racism?" And I'd say, "Yes, I'm going back to Hackney to avoid racism. <laughs> there's no, there's no racism there." And um, um, British, British racism did me a great service in a way, because I grew up with people telling me I wasn't from here. And actually in a different way, my mother telling me I wasn't from here, like you're Barbadian, you know, out there with your English friends, you, you step in here, you're in Barbados, you know. So, um, so um, I never had the challenge of the love of the soil. You, you know, I did that thing. I went to Barbados when I was 17 thinking, oh, I'm home. And then, you, you know, everybody says, like, who are you? And you know you're English, and you think, oh, <laughs> I, I saw this go in a different way. And so, really, having to work on, okay, what, where am I from? What is that? Was what my first book, you know, No Place Like Home, was really, you know, how is this going to work? And for myself, come to the conclusion that my home, my comfort, as you put it, is where my values are. It's where, and other people share my values, and. Um, people who aren't too pompous and who um, like to talk about politics and like to do politics and um, don't talk down to people who are less fortunate or poorer than them, but can make very off color jokes uh, in the hope that no one will repeat them. And um, who um, live are livers of life and lovers of life and who like food and uh, you know there's a range of things that are important to me um uh and that's where my comfort is and i can it's not tied to a place and a combination of racism and migration um disconnected place from that comfort there's nothing wrong with having comfort in a place I wish I could have, in a way, that I could have comfort in the place. When I see, when I go to the Lake District or the Derbyshire Dales or kind of, you know, Arizona in the desert or anywhere, I think, wow, what would it be like? I came from Stevenage, you know, which there was, um, which doesn't give a lot in sense of place. So um, that's where my comfort is. You produce uh, um, motor. Motor racing, great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, which is amazing. Yeah, if anyone here has been to Stevenage, from Stevenage it's yeah. built with roundabouts. Yeah. So you cannot drive fast in Stevenage. Yeah. So how long has it been from there? I used to go clubbing up there Did you? when I was young in the 70s. <laughs> and, yeah, terrible time. <laughs> I think uh, Hamilton said the same thing and got into trouble when he, he called it the. He, he said he was coming from the slums, <laughs> which is, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Didn't go down very well. So, in terms of that Black British identity, what um, you've talked about the kind of Western part of that. Well, what, how do you see the connection with the continent when you're there in South Africa and Sudan? How that part of Black that, British identity. Well, that part of the diasporic identity, because I mean, it's a it's a diaspora, it's a double diaspora, isn't it, from the Caribbean to here, but it's yeah. initially from Africa. And I guess I I saw 
certainly my relationship with Southern Africa was through politics. Um, it was either the Mandela scholars or fellows or whatever who would come. When my mum died, um, uh, some of the money, this was in 1988, some of the money went to the Solomon Mahlangu Freedom College in Zambia, I think. Mm -hmm. um, um, so that was kind of where our interests and our affections were. West Africa, I feel, is more is more of a lived experience for me in terms of um, its engagement with the with the black diaspora with the with the black community here yeah. and um, uh, and Central and Eastern Africa feels virtually. Um, for me, virtually absent from, for me, from Black British culture, not from Black British culture, just in terms of my, my experience of it. Beyond Ethiopian food, um, I don't have much experience of it, but I know that if I lived in Ealing or um, uh, in other parts of the country, that, that those communities tend to be um, uh, quite concentrated. And I said that as someone who lived for a year in yeah. Sudan and so kind of yeah. keeps a bit of an ear out for it and was working with um, people of Eritrean descent. But I was quite intrigued in my interview with Stormzy, the degree to which Stormzy, whose folks are Ghanaian, first of all, has very little interest in America, really. He considers himself very much Black British, but also culturally very African. So uh, the second interview I did with him, which is not in there, and it's actually not in the interview, but during the second interview, um, I'd just been doing some work with Linton Kwesi Johnson. And it, I have a fantasy of a conversation between Linton and Stormzy, which I think would be a wonderful <laughs> interview. And so um, the very small, my very small kind of effort to kind of egg this on, was that I got Linton to sign a book of his to Stormzy, and then I gave it to Stormzy. And what was interesting to me, and no shade on Linton at all, it's just an issue of intergenerational transmission and, and ethnic transmission, is that Stormzy hadn't heard of Linton. Wow. Um, and, um, you know, he's a bright young man, and he was really glad to have the book. And there were two people in the room who were like, oh, yeah, you're going to like that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, don't know, don't care, mm -hmm. but that hadn't come his way. And um, um, I don't think if Stormzy had been from the Caribbean, I don't think that would have been true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's really weird about some, some of, as you say, that intergenerational um, knowledge that is passed down, but also some of the strange conversations. I just had a Windrush book out recently and then on the promotional tour, somebody says, uh, stands up and in all seriousness says, um, you know, Windrush is great. You know, should our new identity now be Windrush? Should we be called Windrush instead of... That's so weird. I, I know, I was... I, I, I kind of said, well, I think that would be a bad idea. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, um, just ending on, on the subject of reparations, I've I come in from Ghana, as I said, you know, CARICOM and the African Union now want to position this. It's gaining momentum. You've written on aspects of that. And there's one essay in the book about the statues mm. and, and how you think that um, you know, that we should you argued against erecting statues to anybody. Mm. And what what's your broader position on on this issue of reparations and the way that you know, we're beginning to look at it as a way as kind of closing um, some of the issues from the past, from about 500 years, and the legacies that you deal with throughout your book. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I, 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 uh, I mean, I was never against it because um, there is a, a clear logic to it. And um, 
and also because it would be an odd thing to be against, really. Um, but I never embraced it. Um, and I'm changing, and I never embraced it because for a few reasons. One, and this speaks against my imagined world in which you would live, but I thought it's never gonna happen. And there are other things that are slightly more likely to happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I, and in a different way, and I, I, I don't think this is unproblematic, I'm just sharing my journey about it with you. Um, um, of kind of saying, I don't know how that conversation, how to start that conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm not equipped to start that conversation. Mm -hmm. There was also a worry for me, and it's still a worry, that if mishandled, then what you could have is people say, okay, how much do you want? Mm -hmm. Okay, here you go. Now shut up. Shut up about racism. Shut up about race. I've paid you off. And so it couldn't just be a conversation about money, <laughs> money. And, and resources. And I didn't, I didn't see, which doesn't mean that, that conversations didn't exist, I didn't see the conversations taking place that went beyond like, we need some of ours back. You need to give us something back. I just didn't see it developed. More recently, because other people have done a lot of work that I didn't do, I can see, uh, and because there is a firm grounding or a firmer grounding around decolonization and so on, it feels like we are almost, I couldn't think of how to start this conversation, but somebody else has started this conversation in a way that feels like it can galvanize people's imaginations, including mine. Mm -hmm. And so um, I am more receptive to it. I was never hostile to it, um, but I'm I'm more receptive to it. And it has involved quite radical shift. So CARICOM, which to be honest, barely bloody existed. They could never, for islands that are so small that you could fit most of them in a phone book, they could never get on about anything. I mean, Nevis tried to secede from some kids, you know, I mean, crazy. Mm -hmm. So um, even with Windrush, um, in, in the Windrush scandal, right up until the, the vital moment, they were kind of um, different countries just stab, stabbing each other in the back. Mm -hmm. So there is a material reality now, mm -hmm. which is um, partly around the end of the Cold War, American indifference, which has forced a collective kind of conversation in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. There is also the issue of climate change, which actually evokes a question around reparations in a different way. Yeah. Um, the, which the damage and loss. Yeah, yeah, which kickstarts a conversation on how it might be had. And um, um, of course, the more it becomes part of statecraft as opposed to campaigning work. Mm -hmm. I think the more likely it will be and the worse it will get. Like the, the more watered down, the least, the less kind of, um, the least, you, it, you know, the more it's about states getting things, the less it will be shaped by mm. popular demands and needs, which doesn't mean it's bad, just means it, it's not going to go the way. Well, it was great that there was a large civil society involvement, so the Rastas and others were there who will hold their feet to the fire, mm. hopefully, in terms of the state. We're going to come to the audience. Uh, thanks, Gary, for the initial conversation. So please put up your hand, say who you are, and say whether it's a question or a comment. Um, so who wants to go first? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? 
Oh, this is okay. There you go. It's okay. Um, I'm quite, I'm, we can I'm hear you. Can hear you. We can hear you. Um, so I'm due to see Lady Charles. I'm a PHR, um candidate here at SOAS. Hello. Um, I um, I was quite um, sort of pleased that the uh, that you mentioned the Black Atlantic, um, Dr. Wambu, and um, it sounds to me, uh, Gary Young, that you have you have positioned yourself your 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 comfortable place is in the Black Atlantic. And you were talking about a conceptual of, of space that there was, it didn't actually have a spatial location, but all these good feelings were there and you could share them and you could feel them. And there was that sort of transmission and mutual feeling of, of comfortableness sounded like the Black Atlantic to me. Is that... Is, a comment? Okay, right, no, I just, I just <laughs> meant, are, are you gonna do anything else? No. Okay, because um, the ball rolling. So, sort of, sort of, but kind of. Truth is that until I grew up around a lot of white people, right? and then I went to Sudan for a year, and then I went to Edinburgh and Russia and Paris, and so my initial political inculcation was through Marxism and class, and I didn't. It's not true that I didn't think about race. I had to think about it all the time just to get through the day. But I didn't really have a critical um, framework for it until I was kind of in, well into my early 20s. And so the only qualifier I would, I would say of that is that um, class is there too. Class is, is really there. And that kind of, I do... Um, you know, Stevenage people are also kind of my people. They are the people I grew up with, and I kind of, I get them. And there is a, and that's not uncomplicated, because they're not uncomplicated. You know, when um, the close, the people you are close to, who could be very racially unpredictable, and vituperative and kind of, I mean, you learn this, I think of racism like a language with many dialects and you learn a dialect, you learn your dialect. That's why I remember I'm back to a racism I understand. I speak fluent English racism. When somebody, my wife's African-American and when she, sometimes we'll be somewhere and we'll be chatting and then, she, you know, come away and I'll be like, what a dick. And she'll be like, what, what, why, what happened? What did they say? And because she doesn't speak the language, you know, and um, um, and likewise in in America, she, you know, there'll be moments where I'll be like, "Oh, that was funny." She'd be like, "No, it wasn't." And um, so, um, so I le yeah, so I speak English like I, I speak English racism really well. <laughs> I understand it really well, and um, and that's because I grew up with it. And that would seem a weird thing to feel comfortable around, but not all of the people who speak that language actually um, believe everything that comes from that language. That's how they were inculcated. And so I, I, you know, what can I say? I learned to, I, I learned that dialect. And I, re I remember at the end of my time in South Africa, in that first election, Bear in mind, I'm 25. Like being away on the, on the company dime is still like a big treat. Staying in a hotel, you know, eating out. And they say you could stay out for another couple of weeks. You could do another story. And I'm in a uh, supermarket. And this white lady, this is in Johannesburg, just walks in front of me. I said, excuse me. She said, it's all right. I've only got a couple of things. Hey. And I said, I don't care how many things you got. You're behind me. Don't worry. <laughs> I won't be long. And I said, well, you're going to be a bit longer. You're going to be after me. <laughs> and she says, oh, don't get so upset. It's all. And I said, just fucking get behind me. <laughs> and honestly, I came away and I just thought, oh, man, now you're shouting at old ladies in the supermarket. You weren't even in a rush. 
like in a different framework, I would have said to someone, I do this all the time. I do the Saturday shop. It's like, I'm like, you go ahead. Like, I've got loads, you know. But it was, and it's not like South Africans would, Black South Africans would just accept it. But to get through the day, there's a, you, you navigate the kind of racism that you're used to. And I, I just thought, Fuck it, I've got to go home, man. Because <laughs> I can't speak this, I can't speak this language. Yeah. And I don't want to learn a new, I don't want to learn a new language of racism. And um, so anyway, all of which is to say that class is, is embedded in it. I do, I don't feel that comfortable around posh black people, actually. Um, uh, sorry? Sorry. What, are you, are you posh? <laughs> um, um, and um, uh, so, yeah, like, you know, class, class, class is a thing. Like in, in America, where there are lots of very wealthy African Americans, there are times when, uh, you know, I feel like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't my scene at all. Not your crowd. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of corrections. No, no Dr. Wambu, just uh, Mr. Ordinary, Mr. Wambu. And, and then secondly, I, I'm making a distinction between the Black Atlantic and the African Atlantic, but that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, apologies for being late. Um, if we can, I would love to have a five minute rant about the state of public transport in the UK, <laughs> but uh, let's leave this for another time. Um, love the book. I uh, love this discussion. I'm a fan of uh, all of your work, all three. <laughs> um, but uh, two questions. Just looking at uh, the current situation in Sudan and reflecting back on how people perceived you in Sudan in terms of identities, how what do you think, uh, if you get the chance to go to Sudan, well, the current state of play, but how would they view you, do you think? The second part is something we don't often talk about, which is we talk about racism from outside against black people, regardless of, uh, uh, you know, from the Caribbean and Africa, but we don't talk about what's happening within our own houses, the racism within the, you know, within black people themselves, um, you know, uh, if you're African American, how uh, you know more recent African migrants in the states uh, would uh, view them here in the UK? Um, you might not have a lot of East Africans and West Africans mixing as often. Um, you know the specific localities, so there is a lot of uh, something also internalized. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Thank you. Yeah. Um... So the first one, remember, remember. How we were seen. Oh yeah. So um, when I was in when I was in Sudan, I was seventeen. I left when I was eighteen. I was teaching in a refugee school in the east in Kassala, and um, I mean, what's interesting about this question is. It's partly about Sudan, right? But it's also partly about me. It's that thing of you never cross the same river twice because you're different and the river's different. So I, when I was there when I was 17, I did not admit that I was English. And that got tricky, right? Because people say, where are you from? And uh, unless you were going to, you say you're from Barbados. Well, what's that like? I've been there once when I was four for six weeks. Um, and so, you know, and this is like the stories that we tell ourselves. I don't think this is kind of unique if you think of the stories that say English people tell themselves about what England is or what Britain is. And then you're like, well, you know, people come over here, arrange marriages. And you're like, that's the royal family. Arrange marriages to foreigners. That's what the royal family does. And, uh, but they're talking about Muslims, right? So I, I don't think it's unique to me, but, um, <laughs> It was the election of four black MPs and a man, because people would just say, you're not from England, because Englishness and whiteness were tightly connoted. So either I was American or I was just African. But I couldn't, neither of which I could really pull off, you know. And it was the election of four black MPs, which was reported in the Sudanese press, and a man coming to me and saying, 
it's true. It's true. <laughs> and I've been there about nine months. She said, and I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, he was like, your compatriots. Mm -hmm. And there was a picture and Bernie Grant was in his regalia and it was validating. And it was the start of, it wasn't Damazine, right? But it was the start of a journey about like, right, I'm working with refugees who have no passport. I'm working with Sudanese people in this incredibly poor country. I have a passport from a rich country. And why am I spending so much effort mm. saying that this country is the only country I really know that I'm not from there? It's not plausible. So then I'm going to have to work out how I am from there, which then took another kind of 10, 15 years. But it was the, it was the beginning of that. If I went back to Sudan now, I'm a tubby 54-year-old man. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, I, I'm not sure they'd be that bothered. And I'd be, and there'd be a way, it'd be a range of ways of exhibiting probably my Westernness, which didn't exist at the time. Um, in the same way, when I was in the Soviet Union, there was this weird thing where the Africans were catching hell. I was in Leningrad, as was. The Africans were catching hell. But somehow, with my sort of, jeans and sneakers and plaits I had at the time, they knew I was an African. And so they assumed I was American. So for the only time in my life, people looked at me and thought, here comes money. <laughs> cars, seriously, cars stopped and turned into cabs. Where are you going? Uh, uh, do you have dollars? I had to vouch for white people <laughs> to get into like hotels and things. I know, I know it sounds to be true. And that kind of, it's because of where I was in that moment. And so I think that um, I go back, you know, if I go back to Sudan, I will be going in a professional capacity. I won't be riding around on a lorry full of onions. Um, I, um, uh, I will be taking cars. I will have my own interpreter. I will be there in a way that will project, uh, uh, and I will be talking to the kind of people who either will accept that or don't really care. And 2023 isn't 1986, 87. So there have been lots of black football players. There has been Rishi Sunak. There have, we, we, you know, you don't need to run with the thing anymore <laughs> saying it's true, it's true. So there's that too. Um, and then the question of internal conflict. There's one thing that is kind of quite interesting about the challenges when there are very few black journalists, which is, these are things that you want, there are lots of things that you want to talk about. And each time I have a column, I have to think, what is the most useful thing for me to talk about? And very rarely has there been the political space I, that I've perceived to talk in a mainstream paper that's going out to most white people to talk about the internal challenges of colorism and inter-ethnic dispute because Someone's getting shot somewhere, someone's getting killed somewhere, someone's being denied the right to vote or so on. And so um, that, that space to be critical within your community, I would have to be writing for, which I did at times, for black organs, you know, organs that would go to black people who, where you could start your point of intervention from a different place, you know of like, look, we've all got that uncle who speaks like this, right? Well, here's why I think that this is a problem and blah, blah, blah. Um, but if you're talking in a more general space, then it's like, well, what uncle? You know, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so I've just, um, uh, I, through most of the time that I was writing, I didn't have the luxury. It felt like it would have been a luxury of that of that space and that in to do that would have been first of all to seed ground somewhere else and secondly to have someone say see they're just as bad as us it's mm -hmm. just it's just all it's all the same and um uh 
But just, even then in the book, there's the Uncle Tom piece, yeah. there's um, the piece about Claudette. So when it's urgent and necessary, or I think it's necessary, I, 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 I try not to ignore it. Just to follow up on that point quickly, and it was a question I had, but I ran out of time. Um, did you think very um, carefully before giving up the column, in as much as you know, there you were having that space every week or every other week to comment on all the big issues, and you're one of the very few um, book life people who are doing that. Did, was that a consideration in you um, taking so long to give it up, or even thinking about not giving it up? Not really. I mean, I, I. I gave it up twice, once when I was going to, to America, and then once again when I came back, and then I both times I started it again. I didn't give it up for very long. Mm. And um and there were different considerations at each time. So to be honest, when I took it up again, it was because um I got two kids. They were quite small. They were, there was Having a column meant that you could have a designated time in a week where you had to work. And then the rest of the time, you could be more available for childcare. So it was just like Thursdays out, right? So uh, school meeting, can't do Thursdays. You know, but otherwise, you might be able to fit your life around it. So that was, because uh, I didn't really want to do one, but it, it fitted well with... Uh, the challenges of parenting. But the other thing, um, and we had this conversation uh, when we came off the train, is that I had to have an idea every Thursday. That is hard. Not Wednesday, that's not good to you. You know, and not Friday, that's too late. You have to have an idea every Thursday. Like my bins go out on Thursday, uh, get collected on Thursday, which means I put them out on a Wednesday night. And I equate putting the bins out on a Wednesday night with like, you haven't got an idea yet. You know, I hate putting out the bins for that reason. And, and it, you know, it's incredibly angst inducing and, <laughs> and also unnatural. Like, because it, it can't just be that you have to have an idea every Thursday. It has to be, you can't have the same idea that you had last Thursday. Uh, it can't be the same issue that you did last Thursday, usually. Uh, so you have to kind of find, and you, but you only know so much. And you can only really, unless you'll just kind of want to run off of the mouth. So then, you you know, after a while, you find yourself cannibalizing your own work and thinking, well, oh, I've said this before, but I'll say it again in a different way, and asking, like, what's the statute of limitations? I remember asking this a couple of times with my editors. What's the statute of limitations about me on this subject? Like, <laughs> if I wrote about it, like, two years ago, can I write about it again? And sometimes I'd be like, I'll give it another year. So, um, no, I was, I was relieved to stop. And I think I'd become, my presence had become an obstacle mm. to other people coming through. Mm. It's all right, we've got black people covered, Gary will do that. Um, so when I leave, then they have to find other people to do it. Mm. I think um, I, it was like they, they could become quite lazy, mm. um, uh, by which I mean the kind of editorial sort of um, structures. And I decided that I wanted to say less things in more depth. Yeah. And I mean, I'm still working on that, but that's what I wanted to do. You're doing longer form stuff now. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, hello, thanks. I'm, I'm Wayne Dooling. I teach African history at SOS. I used to think that um, the sort of prevalence or visibility of Black people, and specifically with regards to the United States, and specifically with regards to a kind of right-wing black people. I used to think that if you had a sort of substantial number of reactionary black people, it, it was an indication of, in the United States, I thought it was an indication of the success of affirmative action and a kind of indicator of how, of the sort of healthiness of race relations mm. in that country. And I'm not sure if I still believe that. And I wondered 
Just your thoughts on that? Am I was I wrong in thinking that all along? Um, I guess <laughs> I wouldn't frame it like that, but my argument would be really passing your point in a way that, and this speaks to my Uncle Tom point, like black people have the right to be as wrong-headed as anybody else. And we all know, and this comes back to the kind of, we've all got that uncle, we all have kind of right-wing people in our families who we know, I think, mostly, um, extended families, if not immediate families. And so, it's never seemed to me that there's anything unnatural. There's something perverse about black people who embrace racism. But there's nothing perverse about black people who, who, who embrace neoliberal policies um, or military policies that, um, um, that defend their privilege. I kind of, um, it's ugly, but it's, it's a normal kind of ugly. And so it doesn't, the existence of a Suella Breverman or a Pretty Patel uh, or a Shina, it doesn't complicate my understanding of the world at all. Um, uh, although interestingly, all of them, with, with the slight exception of James Cleverly, who is also the sanest of all of them, um, all of them are the product, not of affirmative action, but of massive privilege. Um, and each of them, with the exception of James Cleverly, kind of um, uh, complicate our understanding of race with regard to ethnicity, because Pretty Patel, Suella Breverman, Rishi Sunak, they are, it's, it, it doesn't help to say they're Indian. Actually, they're, they're Asians from Africa, which is a kind of, which is a particular ethnic experience, which, would be logical for them to be where they are now, or more logical, not inevitable, not deterministic, but um, you could see how that could happen. Uh, it is telling that the, the black people in that area are from West Africa. They're not from the Caribbean, they're not from East Africa, they're not from Southern Africa. That's also logical. If you look at the large bourgeoisies that exist there, the amount of oil, the amount of money, the class structure that um, uh, has uh, developed. And so um, I wouldn't say that they necessarily make that point, but they certainly don't, they don't refute it either. I thought this for the first time Colin Powell emerged into the mm. kind of in the Cold War, um, emerged into the sort of spotlight, especially from the reaction of the Black person. Yeah, although, but then you saw the kind of the limits, didn't you, with him and um, Sarah Palin? Uh, um, I mean, I thought it was a very interesting moment. Uh, I arrived in America just before the Iraq War, that um, the war beyond George Bush, was being prosecuted by a Jamaican-American, Colin Powell, and uh, Condoleezza Rice, an African-American, raised actually not very far from where Angela Davis was raised in Birmingham. Um, and that it confirmed sort of CLR James's uh, um, conclusion, but observation that African-Americans in many ways, not in every way, but in many ways are as American as anybody else, even more so. They are more kind of, uh, they have an, a, almost a greater investment in the American project because most other people have some other direct ethnicity that they could draw on an African-American standard. R R Richard Wright said something very funny at the, 19, the late 1950s writers' conference when they were all talking about negritude and the people from the Caribbean and Africa were talking about how to fight France and England. And he found it all really amusing because he turned around and said, well, we are the empire. <laughs> we're not the colonies. Um, you had your hand up, sorry. And we'll, it's uh, 7.30, so we'll make that the last question unless there's somebody who's really burning. Okay, we'll... Okay, there are two more, but we can keep the question short. Thanks. 
Yeah, um, my question actually uh, kind of relates to the conversation that we're having now um, and to that last question. So it's this, um, so it's the, the point that you made about Uncle Tom and about the boundaries of identity. And as you've just said, the kind of um, difficulties of kind of essentializing people's identity and expecting them to behave in a certain way. Um, and I understand that there's a class issue at hand as well. Um, but I mean, but don't you think that, um, that actually, you know, the ethnic minorities who tend to be more right wing or who tend to kind of act more out of self interest actually have it easier within a society that's already kind of white supremacist, neoliberal capitalist, um, that actually wants to kind of nurture that selfish side of human nature. And so those minorities within that system uh, then attain uh, a certain capability or a certain recognition that becomes kind of disproportionate because they have greater proximity or greater acceptance by the structures of power that then elevate their voices disproportionately uh, and allow them to kind of gaslight um, the struggles of um, you know, the majority of minorities who are not really having a very good time uh, within these racist societies. So, um, and then also, you know, the fact that nowadays, uh, you know, I kind of wonder where are the inspirations? There are no inspirational leaders uh, anymore. It seems that many of these people have gone and I feel as though the community is kind of drowning and fragmenting. And so with the absence of leadership, and then the favoring of ethnic minorities that sell out uh, by the structures of power, which disproportionately kind of help to reinforce their privilege, enjoy dividing the society. Um, what, what do you feel is, is the way forward? Like how, how, does, how do we solve this situation? Well, I think that, I, I don't think they're necessarily selling out. I think they're just being themselves. I think that they are kind of ruthless, selfish people. And um, uh, that's, you know, who are they selling out? What, what's the Rishi Sirak went to Winchester. He's, he, was a, he was a hedge fund trader. His wife is the scion of one of the wealthiest people in the world. Who is he selling out? I don't think he's selling anyone out. I think that's who he is. I think he's a, a rich man who wants to be much richer. Uh, and... You know, I can't really, it's very difficult to speak to people's motivation or to speak to their experience. You know, how they are experiencing these things. Like you would have to be on the, on the couch, as it were, kind of talking to Priti Patel or someone. But, the, but I, can, I can speak for myself and I wouldn't find it very comfortable to be around people who are that racist and who are kind of just one adjectival slip away from saying something really awful about your mum or your sister or your, you know, your life. That kind of, um, uh, and so it, these things come at a price. And I think the psychic price is really high, actually, or it would be for me. I also think that when these individual right-wing people, one of the reasons that they are, one of the reasons that the right can elevate uh, underrepresented people, also women, much faster than the left, is because usually when people rise through the left, they rise as a tribune of their identity in some way. They are taking other people with them. Diane Abbott's saying, like, Hackney is coming with me, or, or Tottenham is coming with me to Burning Ground. And so they rise slower um, uh, and deeper. That they Well, I don't know you can rise deeper, but they rise with more substance. Mm -hmm. but, but if you believe in an individualist philosophy, and if you're saying, I don't care about, there's no one coming after me, 
It's just me. Then I won't come, come in. And so, you know, Thatcher's rise does not mean the rise of women. And she never claimed it did. Rishi Sunak's rise does not mean the rise of brown-skinned people. And to be fair, I don't think he ever said it did. Um, and of course, that their race is instrumentalized. I would argue Obama's race was instrumentalized in a way. The question is who or what is it instrumentalized for? And then the final point I would make regarding your question is that kind of the, the thing about, you know, there's there's no leaders. And I get I kind of get that, but I don't think that is unique to the black community. Look at the just look at the state of British political culture. Look at what we're left with. Do you know what I mean? Tractor porn, Chris Pincher, um, uh, these kind of very, very mediocre people. Liz Truss, do you remember that? <laughs> so the, when it comes to kind of standards of leadership and capacity to lead and engage, I think we're in a sorry state. I think the Western world is in a sorry state and that um, we are far from being immune from that. We're embedded. We, we are embedded in it. Okay. We're going to take these two last questions very quickly, but keep them short, please. And and, and Gary... Yes, I'll try and keep your, it short. Sorry. Your response to... Because yeah. um, I, I want to try and ensure that everybody who wanted to, to talk can talk. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? Thanks. Um, I'll keep it short. Um, I was very intrigued by your um, talking on uh, your journey of finding English identity. And it's been a topic of conversation that I've been having amongst friends uh, recently. And so my question is, um, do you think that there's enough malleability in the term Englishness to for, for us to live within that? And do you think that the claiming of Englishness is a progressive, if not um, radical, potentially radical act? And my mind sprung to when I was thinking of the question, the video that came out last week in um, Victoria Station during the Palestine marches of the like horrible far right guys and the, the one man in particular saying, I was born in this country. But actually the reality is, you know, for many Caribbean and, and West African descendants, we have been born in this country. And so what's up, our claim to Englishness? What's your thoughts on that? Okay. Shall we hold that so we can get the last question? And okay. you, you, you do both of them together so that we just, um, and we can finish. She's over there, thank you. So okay. mal malleability and mm -hmm. is this? Yes, I actually mm -hmm. want to go back to the questioner before the last one. And thinking of people like Kemi Badenoch and Tony Sewell, how do they fit into your analysis of, um, for example, Badenoch apparently has aspirations of being um, the leader of the Tory party at some stage. Well, and it would seem that both she and Tony Sewell, I don't think they ever actually look in the mirror and actually see what color they are from the things that they actually say. Um, and it is really quite discouraging that you've got two people who are in such positions, but their contribution, it's just like, as you said of Margaret Thatcher, she didn't actually claim she was doing anything for women. So what would those two people be doing <clears throat> for society generally? So, the first question first, and I'm, I, I don't doubt that I may have misspoken because I do misspeak on this uh, uh, as an English person would in interchanging Englishness and Britishness. I only really realised I was English when I went to Scotland, you know, because <laughs> you know because they told you, um, uh, and and being English matters in this um in the entity that we're in um but mostly i think of myself as uh as british really 
um, the, the time when Englishness comes to the fore is really, England, to me, only exists as a football team. You know, the, otherwise, what is it? It's where Scotland stops and Wales stops. They have assemblies or parliaments. We don't. Um, English people only know themselves as English in contradistinction to the Scots and the Welsh in the same way that straight people know themselves as straight because they're not gay. That's the only way in which they think of themselves as being straight. Whereas gay people have to think about being gay, do you know what I mean, constantly. Um, um, you know, white people know themselves as being white when they go to a black country. But otherwise, they're kind of, you know, they, they, they have no race. Mm. And, um, but I do think the Brit Britishness is quite malleable, actually. That kind of, um, there is the benefit of not having a constitution, of this kind of, um, of things not quite said, that, um, that gives more space, I think, than in some ways than being American and or and certainly than being French. Good Lord. Um, so, um, uh, and I think that we have, in a range of ways, race has been at the forefront of actually proving that, of engaging that, of kind of saying, you know, well, wh well, what a, well, what about this? And that I think there's a generation of British people that's not my generation, the generation before, it may well be your generation, who have an understanding of Britishness that is very, very different to the one I grew up with, where Britishness and whiteness were uh, the same thing. I don't think people under the age of 35 think that. I, I, I don't think they face quite the same questions, which is different, a different argument from the argument that that could still not return in some different way. That I think we're in an extended process of negotiation about what it means to be a part of this country. And in that sense, <coughs> actually, I think we're doing quite, I think we're doing quite well in that negotiation, but it's not over. And it could be that it's never over. It could be that it's a constant state of negotiation. And maybe that speaks to a dynamic sense of what Britishness might be. My kind of worldview does not find Tony Shaw or Kemi Badenoch complicated at all. They are bad people who are black. They look in the mirror and they see themselves and they think they are doing a great job. They don't see any contradiction between who they are and what they do. And Tony Sewell, I think, is weirder because of his, like, you know, well, when you think about it, you know, racism did kind of bring us all together in a way, you know. I mean, he said some stuff that, like, I do think, how did you get there? How did you get... That is a kind of corrupted sense of who... Of your psyche, I think. I don't think black people have to think a certain way, but I think it's unnatural for people to think that it's a good idea that they were enslaved or that their ancestors were enslaved. Um, but the idea that, like, I want to put, I mean, you, you know, that they want to put people on boats or they want to kind of, you know, they want to start wars or that is consistent with all the awful black people that they've ever been. It's not, it's not a new thing. What's new is that they're in power in Britain. But the idea of them, I mean, it wasn't white people that hung Ken Sarawiwa. It was black people with the contribution of Shell and you know and uh, and so on. And if we think of the of the problem as being systemic, then the color of the hands that turn the levers that work the system, actually, they can make the system work better. They can make the system work better. They could, they're kind of oil in the machine. If they can, if the system is indifferent to, and they can just extract wealth, power, and culture, I don't know that the system really cares that you're black or whether you're white. The system doesn't care. It's just that that is the way that it's operated. But you only have to look at the overwhelmingly white countries where people are massively impoverished and the places 
that are black, where there are massive, massive inequalities in eco economics and power, to kind of realize that kind of there's nothing to stop black people doing that. Or look at the Holocaust, that was white people doing that, mostly to other white people. So for me, it doesn't turn on race, it turns on power. On that uh, point, where we will end, um, I declare an interest. I do, I do actually, I worked with Tony Sewell at The Voice, and um, I, over the years, uh, I think his position is a little bit more complicated than, um, than I think we've discussed, but we don't have time for that tonight. Um, Gary, thank you so much for such an amazing um, conversation um, going across continents, talking about identity, talking about our, our place in the UK, and your voice that I think, as I hinted here just before the last question, I think we're, getting, we're missing terribly. Um, on a weekly basis at The Guardian. So we hope you'll reconsider and come back again, perhaps not The Guardian, but somewhere else, because um, those uh, pieces that you've written over the last 30 years have been very important pieces for all of us, and for me especially. So thank you very much, and thank you to the audience for coming out. And, and thank I'll you. hand back. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Onyekachi and Gary, for um, a very uh, insightful conversation. Uh, and thank you for everyone to, for joining us um, for the first event of the Center of Product Finger Studies. Please um, check our website. We'll have more events coming up. Uh, they'll be centered on diaspora, on issues around Africa, but also, you know, it's an ongoing conversation so that we'll, be, we'll have more events uh, in the new year. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this evening today. And yeah, have a nice evening. Cheers.